gives us Christ. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, What sign can you show us for doing this? He answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. This week, I was reading about the people of Romania in late December 1989. That was a time of great flux for that country because after a series of protests, there was in fact a revolution. On Christmas Day, Romanian dictator and president Nicolae Ceausescu had been tried and executed. On December the 26th, no one was in charge. Journalists from all across the world descended into Bucharest to get an idea of just what in the world was going on in Romania. One of the challenges that journalists from the English-speaking world had to deal with was to find someone that could speak in English to tell them what was going on. When reporters finally found a woman who could speak English and tell them what was going on, they were met with this response. We have freedom, she said, but we don't know what to do with it. This is, in fact, not just isolated to the Romanians living in the late 1980s. It's something that we human beings have struggled with since our earliest days. In our first reading this morning, we hear the Ten Commandments. These words are given to God's people as a gift to those who have been set free. The Hebrew people had been in bondage, in slavery in Egypt. And that slavery had been horrible for them. Now that they had been released from that slavery, God gives them these words, not just commandments, but rather teachings to show them what it looks like to live in the freedom that he has given to them. The Ten Commandments start with the affirmation that it is God who has brought the Hebrew people out of slavery. They did not earn their freedom. They were given that freedom as a gift as they crossed the Red Sea. Now in what is commonly called the Ten Commandments, God shows them who he is and what that freedom looks like. It all begins with God declaring what has happened. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I really wish that the Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, had started with a because with that sentence. Because I'm the Lord your God who rescued you and gave you freedom. And then put in a therefore. Therefore, live this way. Which is exactly the opposite 
of how many folks think when they think about the Ten Commandments. In many and various ways, the Ten Commandments are reduced to ten things that we should and shouldn't do. It's as if some people would say, well, here are ten rules. Obey them, or else God will come down with the divine hammer to come and get you. These commandments, though, are better thought of as teachings. And they show the world what it looks like to live as God's holy and liberated people. They are not meant to be a burden to God's people, but instead are meant to be a gift that God gives to us. These words that God speaks are guides so that we can be helped in our daily life. There are other ways that we can live. But ultimately, those ways of living are dangerous. And they will not lead us to the life that really is life. So now that we have been free, now that we have been liberated, what does it look like to be holy? What does it look like to belong to the God who brought us out of the land of slavery and into the land of freedom. This is how. And it starts with worshiping God. The Hebrew people knew that there were alternatives to worshiping the Lord their God. They lived in Egypt for a very long time, and there were other gods that were worshiped in the land that they lived in. But because this is the God who brought Israel out of slavery and into freedom, there's no need to worship any other God at all. But this is not the only temptation when it comes to worshiping God. Whilst many may want to worship another God, still others will in fact confuse creation with creator, making idols out of that which cannot provide freedom. So no idols, because those idols will ultimately wind up enslaving us. And the Exodus is a reminder that slavery is over. The same can be said for misusing God's name. This is the God who has power to save. And because we can call upon this God in any need, in any time or any place, we use God's name with the utmost respect and reverence. And then there's the Sabbath. One of the unique parts of Jewish and then later Christian teachings is in fact this idea of Sabbath. Throughout history, one of the consistent things that people of faith, our Jewish friends and our, and our Christian brothers and sisters, one of the things that we have done is to take Sabbath. Now, while some historical sources will talk about Jews and Christians as being lazy for taking a day off, the true witness of this idea of Sabbath is that we can trust in the God of Israel. Now, of course, there are many times that we foolishly think that we are vital and that we must take all the time that we have in the world to do nothing but work. We don't want to let people down. And so in the name of thinking that we're doing good, we will work all the time. But the Sabbath is ultimately a test of our faith in God. It is a matter of trusting in God's goodness, knowing that the one who gave us our freedom will continue to sustain us. So rather than working all the time, God has given us the gift of rest. By the time we get to thinking about things like respecting life and marriage, property, and even truth, we realize that it's not just about how we treat God that matters. The logic of the Ten Commandments is that we cannot be the people 
that God is calling us to be on our own. We need others. And because we will always be in relationship with others, we must have boundaries so that we can live in the wholeness and peace that God desires for us. Faithful worship of God always leads to proper love of neighbor. In other words, because I am called to have no other gods before God, I won't bow down at the altars of money, sex, power, or fear, or whatever it is in my life. Because when we worship at those other altars, at those things that will not, in fact, give us life, we will exploit other people and things for our own personal gain. When we are called not to murder, we are reminded that all human beings are created in the image and the likeness of God, and therefore, every single person that we come in contact with, no matter how much we may or may not like them, is a gift to be treasured. The living out of the Ten Commandments is not about living for the sake of the law. It is about living out a relationship. First with God, who comes to us in both law and gospel. The same God who invites us to splash in the waters of baptism that we just saw this morning. The same God who comes to us in bread and wine but also at the same time, the same God who sends to us people that we come in contact with. It comes as we honor all that has been given to us by this God. The gifts of creation, the gifts of neighbor, the gifts of the gospel itself. This is what it looks like to live in the freedom that God has given to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.